Thank you, Jim and Wendy, for that prayer. Uh, it's great to see you this morning. Great to be together and spend this time together. Thank you for making worship a priority. Um, today, we're going to embark on a journey. And we're going to be working through one of the four biographies of Jesus uh, in a sermon series that's going to go until Easter. And we want to invite you to join us through this journey by reading along through the Gospel of Mark. We've put together a reading guide where each week we've got some chapters set aside for you to read. Um, we invite you to read them at your own pace, uh, read them in the translation of your choice. Uh, in the guide, you're going to see some helps, but we would love for you to join with us in these next number of weeks as we walk through the Gospel of Mark together. Uh, if you do not have a Bible, you can use a Bible app like YouVersion. Uh, you can go online and use a website like Bible Gateway. Of course, you can buy a book of the Bible, of the Bible as well. Um, but we would invite you to join us. And if you've never read the Bible before, you're kind of the person I'm thinking about the most right now, where I would love for you uh, to join us through this series, read along with us, um, because I think this will be helpful, especially if you've never, never, ever read before. If you fall uh, behind, you can uh, watch services on, on our YouTube channel here. You can download the podcast and listen to those to keep up if you're not able to make it every week. Uh, but we'd love for you to join us. And some of you might ask, you know, you're always, always inviting us, always challenging us to, to be reading the scriptures together. Why is that? Well, because scripture is one of those habits that is absolutely essential if you and I want to grow in our faith and grow in our ability to trust Jesus with more and more of our lives. It helps us better understand who God is, how he speaks, how he works, how he moves, uh, when we see the themes of God, we understand kind of some of the things he might be calling us to in our lives. And even more importantly than that is when you actually read the scriptures, something supernatural happens. In that the Holy Spirit is actively involved when you and I are reading and is able to show us things, teach us things. I've even heard some of you use phrases like, I read this passage and it spoke to me. That's the Holy Spirit at work in the habit of reading Scripture. And so I want to invite you to walk with us through the Gospel of Mark, expecting that God is going to speak to you in the midst of this series and that it will be a life-giving experience for you. Um, again, let me just say for those of you who've maybe never read the Bible before or it's been a really long time, and maybe you would even say to me, look, Rob, I don't even know that I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't really believe all the claims that Jesus makes about himself or about life. I'm not even sure I believe in Christianity. That I would really invite you to join us. Even try it just for a few weeks. Um, because you're actually the kind of person that the Bible was written for in particular. The kind of person that Mark had in mind when he was writing his gospel. And so I would invite you to join us. Now, one of the things that we learn right away as soon as we jump in is that reading the Bible is not as easy as oftentimes people like me make it sound. Uh, we have this expectation that we open the book, angels sing, God speaks from heaven, everything is crystal clear, and it's easy, and whatever God is calling us to is easy. But reading the Bible takes work. Learning to read and try to figure out what was the original author's intent when they wrote this, that takes work. It takes sometimes some resources. And in fact, as you look at the, uh, the reading guide that we gave to you, there's some links on there to some resources that may help you better understand the gospel of Mark written in the first century, what was going on in the time that will help you better interpret it and, and, and figure it out. Because it takes a little bit of effort on your part and on my part as we do this together. And these sermon series and this, these sermons we hope will be, will be helpful as well. So until Easter, we're going to journey through the Gospel of Mark. Well, why Mark? Well, most importantly, because it allows us to follow the person of Jesus up close and personal. And uh, just to have our eyes and heart open to who he was, his message and his call and invitation to each of us. Uh, Mark is able to give us a close account on the life of Jesus because Mark is really recording the stories of Peter. And so think of Mark as Peter's secretary. 
Uh, the ancient historian pa Papias, around 100 AD, wrote, Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote down accurately, but not in order, and that's going to be important, all that he remembered, said, and had been done by the Lord. So think of Mark as kind of capturing Peter's accounts of the life of Jesus. And we know as we'll go through the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that Peter was there uh, in such a personal way with Jesus through all of his ministry. And as will become clear, Peter, who had the front row seat, was absolutely captured by this person of Jesus of Nazareth. And that all that he claimed and what he said and that what he did was really like none other. I mean, Jesus makes claims about being divine. Even though he's clearly special, he prefers ordinary people. He heals people sometimes by word, sometimes by touch, sometimes by his own saliva. He touches lepers. He's anointed by a prostitute. He reveals the moral rot of the religious system of his day. He raises a teenager from death to life. I mean, it's astounding. Uh, and so much so that even at the very end of his gospel, Mark captures a Roman military guard who would have been groomed and indoctrinated in the message of Rome, which was that the Caesar is Lord and there's no other Lord under heaven other than Caesar. And this guard confesses that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. And I can't help but think it doesn't say so in the text, but he would have lost his life for such a blasphemous claim in the shadow of the Roman Empire. And then Jesus himself, uh, arrested and tried, crucified, and Peter actually has a personal encounter with Jesus after he's resurrected. And so as we come to this gospel account, it's a story that Peter says must be told, and Mark is the one who shares it with us. So let's jump in. Uh, open up your Bibles, open up the Bible app on your phone to Mark chapter 1. Uh, we're going to get through just to verse 20 today in the first chapter. Uh, I'm going to read for you just the first verse now and then make a few comments about it. But Mark chapter 1 verse 1, it reads like this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of of God. Now we have to stop there because even in this one verse, Mark wastes no time in making some huge claims that really give shape to and kind of mark the tone, excuse the pun, of the whole gospel. Uh, he, he talks, first of all, that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah or the anointed one. He's the son of God. And this is huge, controversial, blasphemous, in some ways, kind of news. Mark makes a danger and, and dangerous and controversial confession. One that appears, in fact, there's three confessions in the Gospel of Mark that are important. This one, one in the middle, and one at the very end. Now, we'll keep coming back to this theme about Jesus being the Son of God because it's this claim that causes people to stumble probably more than any other claim in the Scriptures, and in particular in Mark's Gospel. And maybe it's caused you to stumble as well. Uh, maybe it's one of the reasons that you don't read the Bible. Maybe it's one of the reasons that you're not sure you take the Christian faith all that seriously. This idea that Jesus claims to be divine. And rightly so, it's a huge kind of claim. It's the kind of claim that if you or I make it, it's going to end us with a consult with the mental health. C.S. Lewis said this, that Jesus' claim to be divine means one of three things. He's either a liar, meaning he's intentionally misleading us. He's a false prophet. He knows it. He's a lunatic, he's out of his mind, or he's being truthful, that he actually is who he claimed he was. And Mark is writing to people like you and I who are wrestling with this claim of Jesus being the Son of God and trying to figure it out. So right at the start, he gets up close and personal with us, and he wants you and I to wrestle with this claim. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe he is who he says he is? Now, maybe you're comfortable with Jesus being an incredible teacher or a significant historical figure, but the claim that he's the Son of God is not a line you're ready to cross yet. Fair enough. You should explore and wrestle with this seriously, because if it's true, which I believe it is, you cannot continue just to live your life as you are now, which is exactly Mark's point. 
And Mark wants each of his readers, including you and I, to read his account, to be convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, and like Mark, to confess it and to let it transform your life. So, for Mark, he not only wants us to see that Jesus is the Son of God, he wants us to know that the truth of that is good news. And it's not just good news for religious people. It's not just good news for people of a certain economic status. It's good news for everybody. Let's keep reading. Mark verse two, chapter 1, verse 2 to 11. As it is written in Isaiah, who was a prophet from the Old Testament, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. The straps of his sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and the angels tended to him. So let's just stop for a second and think about this scene where Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist, the first Christian hipster. He was baptizing people, not in a place that was normal for their time. Look, every little village had a Jewish synagogue with a little baptismal font in it that they could have used. There were streams and rivers everywhere. Why would John go out of his way to the Jordan River to be baptizing people and be baptizing them with a baptism of repentance? Well, we have to go all the way back to the book of Joshua and think about the symbolism of the Jordan River. Israel had been in the desert for 40 years wandering. It was finally about to enter the promised land and the last barrier they had to cross in order to enter the promised land found in Joshua chapter 3 and 4 is the Jordan River. The Jordan River the people had to stand in the water and cross through the waters in order to get to the promised land. And now John is standing in that Jordan River again, inviting people to enter the waters and discover the gateway to the new promised land through a, a baptism of repentance. Now, a baptism of repentance is not a ritual cleansing. Um, it's not a purification rite. When you hear the word repentance, you should Picture uh, a U-turn. That's what should come to your mind. Imagine that you, you're going to get a few groceries, you leave your house, you get in your car, you're driving down the street, and suddenly you realize you forget your wallet. Well, being a dutiful citizen, uh, you go to the end of the block, do the proper roundabout, and go back to your home. Or, if you're totally rebellious, you do a U-turn in the middle of the road right there, and then not encouraged or sanctioned by me. This is the image of repentance. You're going one direction, you stop you turn and you go in another direction. And this is what John was inviting people into, a spiritual U-turn. You're heading this way with your life. You're heading down this path. You have these priorities. You have this sense about where life is found and what's going to make you happy and where there's going to be contentment. And then suddenly you come face to face with a reality that changes that and you turn and you go in another direction. This idea of repentance captures an encounter with something greater than what you knew before. It encounters a decision to, to surrender and to go in a brand new direction. And it's what John was baptizing people into. Now, in this very short description of Jesus' baptism, something incredible is described, and that's the Trinity. It's one of those passages in the Bible where the Trinity is on full display, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. 
Now, the Trinity is a unique feature in the Christian faith, and we do not have time to unpack it uh, to its fullest here, and certainly I am no expert. But the scriptures reveal to us one God in three persons. If we could put it into a math equation, it would be this. One plus one plus one equals one. Not one-third plus one-third plus one-third equals one. Now, if you're a high school student right now studying for exams, don't use that math uh, in your exams next week. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. And all are fully divine. They are all eternal. They have all always been present. And yet they each have their own distinct form. And we see that very, very well captured in this passage. God the Father is speaking to God the Son. And the Holy Spirit comes down and descends on Jesus the Son. Now, if your brain is feeling a little bit like a pretzel right now, good. You're kind of at the point that all of us get to when we start to wrestle with the doctrine of the Trinity. It is called a mystery of the Christian faith. And one of the things that I love about the concept of the Trinity is that we can't fully understand it. And to be honest, if you can fully understand everything about God and it's easy to understand and it's easy to explain, then God is really not that big. Now, we have this mind-bending revelation. John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus the Son. The Holy Spirit comes and hovers over Jesus. The God the Father speaks these words to his son in this moment. And what gets revealed? What gets captured in kind of this historical, uh, powerful moment? And it's this, love. In this moment, what gets expressed from God the Father and the Spirit to Jesus the Son is these tender words of love and acceptance. The Father says what every, fa- what every um, son and daughter long to hear from their parents You are loved, and I am well pleased with you. Now, we cannot miss. Jesus has not done a thing. He has not preached a sermon. He's not healed anyone. He's not driven out any demons. He's not yet attracted a crowd. And yet his heavenly Father speaks a word of love and acceptance to him which should speak to you and I and remind us that if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and if we have an encounter with him, our encounter with him in that moment is, should be one of love. And let's keep our eyes open because as we go through the Gospel of Mark and as we watch Jesus have interactions with people, one of the things that's going to constantly get Jesus into trouble is the way in which he extends that love to people that other folks don't think should deserve it. Let's continue reading. Mark chapter 1, 14 to 20. After John was put in prison and Jesus went to Galilee. This is classic Mark. We're moving on. We had the baptism. Okay, that's done. Jesus got tempted. Okay, that's fine. Uh, By the way, John's now in jail and we're off into Galilee. He proclaimed the good news of God. And here we have like Jesus' very first sermon. John chapter 1, or Mark 1 verse 15. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent. And believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, who was Peter, who was actually giving this account to Mark. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, and they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat, which I'm sure he was thrilled about, with the hired men, and they followed him. So, immediately after the baptism, we have these words, this kind of first sermon Uh, out of Jesus' mouth, kind of the very first words that the the New Testament captures uh, of Jesus' words, because Mark's gospel is the earliest gospel. And he must have gone to the same school I did because he preaches a good three-point sermon. Jesus says three things. First, the kingdom kingdom has come, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, and repent and believe the good news. The time has come. God is doing something. 
the time that you have been waiting for, that God would break into the world and bring salvation. That time has come. It was true for people then, and it's true for us today, which captures this theme in Mark's gospel, which is you have to decide what you're going to do with the person of Jesus because the time has come. He's here. The Son of God has come to us. And each of us now have to wrestle with, what are we going to do? Do we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Mark's not interested if you like him. He's not interested in knowing whether you think Jesus was a nice guy. He wants to know, do you believe that he's truly the Son of God? And have you made your confession that Jesus is the Son of God by being baptized with a baptism of repentance? I know, Mark's not easing us into the story. He's getting right up in our face right away with this powerful fact. You know, you and I are not baptized because we have all the answers. We're not baptized because we're model Christians. We're baptized because we make the confession that Jesus is the Son of God. And we're going to follow him with our life. And as we kind of begin this brand new year, 2021, I want to present a challenge to those of you today who would say, you know what, I do believe but I've never been baptized, that it's time for you uh, to respond to this invitation of Jesus to follow him and to follow him by being baptized. We would love to have a conversation with you about that. The next thing he says is the kingdom of God has come near. This is such good news. Uh, We're going to talk a lot about the kingdom of God in this series, Uh, but the kingdom of God is simply where God is reigning and ruling, where God has his way. Now think about it this way. We don't use this language. Um, But when you go to visit someone's home, you're visiting their kingdom. You're visiting the physical space where they reign and rule, where they get the final say about how things are done, how things are decorated, how it should feel, how high the heat should be turned up, uh, all of those things. Each of us in our own home kind of create our own little kingdom. And when you walk into someone's home, you get a sense about what they're like by their kingdom. You get a sense about what their priorities are by looking at all the things that they have set up in their home. All of this gives us a deeper understanding. And Mark is saying, as you think about the kingdom of God, as you watch Jesus, as you watch the way he treats people, as you watch what he says, how he responds when he gets approached by demon-possessed people, by sick people, by needy people who just want him for a miracle, by sinful people. How does he respond in that moment? Because it tells us something about what God's kingdom is like. More importantly, it tells us about what God is like and what it would be like for you and I to follow him, what it would be like for you and I to interact and connect and to give our lives over to him. Which is really Jesus' last point in his little sermon here. An invitation. Repent. Believe the good news. Now, I need to be honest with all of you today. If you're going to go through the Gospel of Mark with us and you're going to read through it each day and spend time reading the scriptures and you're going to follow us uh, with these messages through this series, I need to let you know you at some point are going to have to come to a point of repentance about something in your life. You and I cannot come in contact with the person of Jesus, get an understanding of his call on our life and in the kingdom that he's inviting us into, and not need to make changes. Each and every one of us. So I'm giving you fair warning that as we go through this series, each of us are going to have to come to a moment where we've been going down a certain path and going a certain direction and believing that we're going to find life or that our way is best and we're going to come face to face with Jesus calling us to go a different way. And so Mark captures it here in this, these beautiful words of Jesus, repent, I invite you to follow me but you're going to have to repent. You're going to have to do a U-turn if you want to keep company with me. The final part that we read today in these passages is about these first disciples. We're going to hear lots about them, so we won't get too far into them today. But they're wrestling with the same thing you and I are wrestling with. Is Jesus the Son of God, and will I follow him? 
Is he who he says he is? And we would know, as you read further in the scriptures, that just because the disciples started following him, they didn't have all the answers. They weren't maybe 100% sure that he truly was who he said he was. There's moments along the way their doubts get revealed. Which is a fascinating reminder that you and I can still start to follow Jesus even if we aren't fully convinced yet who he is. So, is Jesus the Son of God? And will you follow him? Will you reorder your life around him? Will you let him be the first priority in your life? And will you set aside his kingdom for yours? These are the challenges. These are the themes. This is the invitation we're going to get into as we continue in Mark's gospel. Let me pray for us. God, today we thank you uh, for the way in which you engage us right off the start with these words. We thank you today for this claim that we all have to wrestle with of whether or not Jesus is the Son of God, Lord, and whether or not we would give our lives to follow him. Lord, I just know that even as uh, we're talking about this, there's some people who are absolutely sure, yes, they've made that decision. Lord, they're on their way. They need to make some changes, Lord, but they're in. And yet, Lord, today I know there are people who just are not sure. Father, I pray that they would stick through this series, that they would read, that they would stay engaged along the way, Lord, and that they would be open at least to wrestle with the question and see what happens. And so, Lord, today, may we all come to this this passage. May we come to this beautiful gospel story. And may we bring our hearts open and ready to see where you would lead us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.